Facebook live event. Um, I'm uh, the representative from Washington State's second congressional district. I'm here in Everett, Washington in my office. And I can see the north end of my district up near Bellingham because we've got a beautiful view of Mount Baker today here in the Pacific Northwest. And the district stretches down to the King Snohomish County line, uh, Mount Lake Terrace and Briar would be the south end. And we also have the beautiful San Juan Islands and uh, Whidbey Island as well. So uh, it's a great day here in the Pacific Northwest and always a great day to talk about libraries and books and education. And we've got that going here today. And I want to thank you for um, joining me to hear about some of the educational resources that are available for uh, schools and parents from not just your local library system, but from the Smithsonian and from the Library of Congress. If you're unable to watch this entire presentation today, or if you know someone who would like to watch, there will be a recording available on uh, my Facebook site and my YouTube page after the conclusion of this event. First, I wanna to acknowledge today's discussion will only address part of the immense burden that parents and educators are feeling this year. Schools um, have not fully reopened here in our state. They at some point will fully reopen, but when the state and local school district officials decide when it is appropriate and safe to do so. As students, teachers, and families begin the school year with remote learning to, in order to slow the spread of COVID-19, families have continued to struggle with the economic burdens imposed by the pandemic. And many kids across our state here in Washington State are without reliable internet access still, and it's making productive online learning nearly impossible for some kids. Other families find themselves, though, going to food banks for the first time, while others have lost access to free and reduced priced school lunch programs that they depended upon. For instance, Northwest Harvest here in our state has um, said hunger has nearly doubled in Washington state since the pandemic began. So throughout this pandemic, hunger advocates, educators, and parents have had to overcome challenges to meet the needs of their communities and of their loved ones. So there's a lot of work to be done. An upcoming pandemic aid package must help schools teach safely by providing cleaning and protective equipment and funding access to broadband and other technologies. And I am a strong supporter of increased virus testing and for contact tracing to fight the pandemic so schools can safely open sooner. I recently supported a funding bill to extend important nutrition waivers as well, to help ensure that schools have the flexibility needed to feed students. And additionally, the House of Representatives recently passed a revised version of the HEROES Act, and we hope to break the, uh, the a gridlock in Washington, D.C by getting the Senate to come along with us. That updated HEROES Act includes $175 billion in flexible funding for K-12 education all over the country to ensure schools can adequately plan for effective remote learning and guarantee resources needed for safe in-person education where it's appropriate. So I'll continue to stand with you all to ensure that you, your students, and your children have the tools they need to succeed now and into the future. And on that point, we've got a great panel uh, because we're not waiting for this to happen. We're trying to attack this problem now with the resources that are available. And we've got a great discussion ahead of us with a, a panelist from the Smithsonian, from the Library of Congress, and from our own uh, Snow Isle Regional Library. Um, our panelists today are um, uh, Lois Langer Thompson, who's the, um, uh, I forget the exact title, she runs the place. That's what. That's all you need to know. She runs the library system, the Snow Isle Regional Library System. We're glad to have uh, Lois on. And then uh, Ruki Nuhold Ravikumar is with the uh, Smithsonian uh, Institution, and very glad to have Ruki on from Washington D.C. And then uh, um, Cheryl, I want to get it right. Cheryl Letterly, she's an educational resource specialist with the Library of Congress, and they're all joining us today to talk a little bit about the resources that are available to all of you um, uh, for use uh, for education at home or for education in school. Uh, and this is one of the um, great resources that we have available for you. As I say, as taxpayers, you're already paying for it, so you might as well use it. Um, so uh, with that, I want to um, uh, uh, have each of them give a presentation. 
we'll go through presentations. I think they're going to be very informative. And then I've got questions as well after all the presentations are done. And then maybe we can have a little, a little cross talk with the panelists as well. And then we'll end at about um, uh, three o'clock here uh, in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, if, if that uh, works for everybody, uh, let's go with it. And I want to um, turn it over to, to Lois Langer Thompson with the Snowile Regional Library System. Lois? Great. Thank you so much, Congressman Larson, for organizing this and uh, bringing us together to talk about the importance of supporting our students. And also, it's a great pleasure to be with representatives from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian, two of my favorite institutions in the world. So I'm very pleased to be with my colleagues here. So today I'm going to share some of the ways that Snow Isle Libraries is supporting students and their families. And if you are not in our service area, um, please check with your local library because they are doing many of the very same things. So our first thing that I want to talk about is our first commitment is to connecting in person. Our vision for Snow Isle Libraries is that everyone in our community is connected to their library. And one of our goals during this time when connection became a little more challenging was to try to provide as good as or possibly even better than in-building service whenever possible. And that, most, that happens most importantly in our connection people to people. So our library staff are here for you and we are ready to help. This spring, uh, we began by calling over 50,000 of our customers just to connect to hear what was going on and to hear what they needed. And we were able to provide a lot of access to online resources in the immediate. As we move and were able to go into contact free, um, customers could uh, these, and we've started remote printing, which is incredibly popular and helpful for students and their families. And we are loaning laptops and hotspots for those who don't have access to those resources. Our new favorite is quick picks. And um, what I hear mostly from people, what they miss is the browsing. They miss just coming in and finding those things they didn't even know they wanted and having that time. But we will do it for you in the meantime while we're waiting to re reopen our buildings. I also want to thank Congressman Larson for his leadership around the federal support we received, um, E-Rate and the CARES Act funding for hotspots and PPE that have allowed us to provide this service. And I also just can't emphasize enough, we have library staff in our buildings, they are ready. You can chat, email, phone, online, text, you can book a librarian. There is a person ready and able to help you. And we know that connecting online is really important. And we knew this back in March, and it has um, come back uh, this fall as students started school, that our parents, our students, uh, we see this as a community-based effort, that this isn't, uh, this is all of us together supporting each other. And so first I want you know, you can get a card immediate access. Um, you just fill out a form online and you'll have immediate access to online resources. Some of those are listed. Um, homework help is the best thing for parents. There are online tutors ready to help you. They are math experts and science experts. So if you are out of your wheelhouse of knowledge, feel free to reach out to our online tutors. We also have really great Wi-Fi in our parking lots. You can drive in and use that Wi-Fi. And we know that Congressman Larson and others are working on the access, broadband access throughout our state so that people can have it in reliable broadband access in their home. But in the meantime, feel free to come to our parking lot. Um, we are, as I said, lending laptops. We have remote and contact-free printing. And then our eBooks, which have been around for a long time, but we've certainly seen a lot more use. And one of the really exciting partnerships we have developed with our vendors is uh, access, unlimited access to our ebooks. So teachers can select a book and every student in their class will have access to it. And if you have any questions about that, you know what I'm gonna say, just give us a call and we'll be happy to walk you through it. We've also pivoted to a lot of online programs. Uh, Storytime's been a favorite, but a couple of things that we're very proud of are our third grade reading challenge. That, um, that was a quick pivot in the spring to celebrate all the work student teams had done to uh, build their third grade, their, excuse me, their reading skills as third graders. And we are starting that program up again this fall. We also have a family trivia night and I have sat in that. I am no good at trivia, but I love to watch it. So 
you know, we're used to watching Zoom where there's one person per box. And when we do family trivia night, sometimes we have three people, eight people in a box answering. And it's just exciting and fun as families learn together. And then a, a personal favorite of mine is reading with Rover. So as kids are learning and building their skills, they can read with a dog. And we all know that nobody loves you more than your dog and nobody judges you less than your dog, but it's a great opportunity um, online even to help kids build their reading skills and confidence. And then just an encouragement, we launched a brand new website on Monday. It's very easy to search by age, by kids and teens, where you'll find online uh, resources for their health, for their students, their homework, and also for choosing books by, uh, by age group. And then the other piece that we're thinking a lot about is the importance of connecting offline, that as students spend a lot of time, and as we all as adults spend a lot of time online right now, there is a need to find ways to get outside and enjoy. And, as Congressman Larson said, we're having one of those beautiful fall days here in the Pacific Northwest, but even in the rain, you can go out. So we have some to do to go activity kits that you can pick up. Some of these are STEM based and some are art. They're just ways to engage families in activities together to learn. We've set up some scavenger hunts and story walks in some of our communities so you can get out and explore your local neighborhood in a safe way. And uh, this, uh, later this month, we'll be having bingo cards come out that will help you do some different activities to get moving. And it's an important reminder that um, part of learning is the physical to move your body as well as your brain. So we are wanting to support that as well. And so as I close and get ready to turn it over, this was a really great day we had in at the Marysville Library with, um, if you can see in there, it's Dr. Hayden and from the Library of Congress and Congressman Larson, who did a really fun story time uh, science based on astronauts, and it was, it was really fun. And so if you need a reader for story time, either one of these two will do a great job for you. So um, I'm happy to pass it to my next colleague and ready to answer any questions later on. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lois. I want to uh, now um, introduce um, uh, uh, Ruki Newhold Ravi Kumar. She's the Acting Undersecretary for Education for the Smithsonian Institution. Ruki. Thanks so much, Congress Larson. It's been such a pleasure to join you all. Lois, that was so great to hear all the great resources. So I'm gonna share my screen as well and uh, share some of what we have at the Smithsonian with you. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen. The Smithsonian is over 174 years old and through that we have maintained the mission to increase and to pursue the increase and in diffusion of knowledge. Uh, while we continue to work on reopening our museum slowly, the diffusion of knowledge has continued to be a challenge during these, these times. Um, I know a lot of organizations put content online to support schools, and we did too, so I'd love to walk you through a few free resources available to you. The first one is this platform. It's learninglab.si.edu. This is a free platform through which you can search through the millions of digitized resources across the Smithsonian. We have 19 museums, nine research centers, three cultural centers, three educational centers, and a zoo. So instead of you trying to go to each one, um, you can search really the entire collection through this. What's really great Ricky, about this, yes? The, the, uh, your, just uh, your presentation isn't advancing, so. You're still on your title page, at least what, that's what I can see. Okay. Um, I hope, are you seeing a learning lab page right now or no? Uh, I am not, but uh, Lois, what are you seeing? Okay. Okay. I think you just need to start the slideshow. I did. Uh, let's see. Let me so stop. Doing, we're going to make this work, people. <laughs> Okay, bear with me. Let me try sharing again and we'll see. Do you, what do you oh, see yeah. now? I see bugs and zebras and all Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so this kind of tells you the breadth of what we have at the Smithsonian from museums to cultural centers and the zoo. 
Um, so this is the platform that I was talking to you about not too long ago. Thank you for letting me know that you weren't seeing my slides because why would you want to miss all this fun stuff? This is the platform through which you can really search through all of the Smithsonian's digitized collections and you can search, you can digitally collect, you can contextualize and add your own context to it. So if you're a teacher, this is a really great sandbox tool for you to think about how the Smithsonian resources can complement your classroom. And once you've created a digital collection, you can also share it with others. And if you, are, if you look at other teachers' collections, you can also copy somebody's collection and modify it. So it creates a real community of practice here where we can all create great stories, tell really interdisciplinary stories, interconnected stories, because sometimes the story does not stay in one museum. Something like the Hope Diamond, the story starts maybe in our Natural History Museum, but the envelope that it actually reached the Smithsonian in is at the Postal Museum. So to tell that full story, it's really nice to learn to discover. Here are some examples of collections that teachers have made. Here's a great example of a teacher who's teaching chemistry using spacesuit materials and talking about materiality. We have a teacher here who's teaching students about math and geometry through art. So you can really make interesting connections, um, unusual and non-traditional pathways into fields um, where it's really abstract concepts. So I know a lot of Students might be a little terrified of math or don't feel like they have the aptitude for it. So a fun way to introduce it would be through art or history. And these are the rich introductions that you can make to content using resources at the Smithsonian. Besides teachers in the K through 12 system around the country creating collections, Smithsonian educators also put together some collections spanning stories from all over our museums and centers. Um, earlier this year when there was a big debate on should we wear a mask or not wear a mask, what we did was really collect stories about the history of masks, the science, where you can see how masks have been used in different cultures across different spans of time. And what may have been maybe an art project not too long ago has taken on new meaning these days. And perhaps this at least gives you that inspiration to design a new mask for yourself. What we also did was knowing how many different organizations we have within our Smithsonian family, we started to ask schools and teachers what they needed the most help with, because if the Smithsonian put everything we have online, it could be completely overwhelming. And we know that a lot of you teachers did find it overwhelming earlier in March when everyone was telling you what they had online. So we took a real user-centered, learner-centered approach we talked to teachers and asked teachers, what do you need? And we started to consolidate based off of needs at this page. So if you need a friendly introduction, a one-stop shop for all your distance learning needs, then start here at learninglab.si.edu slash distance learning. I'm going to quickly walk you through what's at this page. So we do have um, resources for schools that are organized by grade level. We have the same resources available in Spanish language. We also have resources specifically for DC area schools. And then we know as dining rooms turned into home offices and home schools that caregivers and families, you needed some help too. For teens and tweens who didn't, don't have access to your usual set of resources, there's some content for you. And if you'd really just like to speak to an expert join us at an upcoming session where we have virtual office hours where you can look for whatever it is that you need help with we also have several events in a calendar that gets populated where you can talk to a smithsonian expert a curator or join a webinar um, these are all really great opportunities for you to engage in so a quick review there are uh, resources organized by grade level resources for families and caregivers. So things like how do you talk to your kids about what's going on with COVID. Um, there are also these things that we call choice boards because we know some of you just want to unplug and just use pencil and paper. And there are some of you maybe don't have access to technology all the time. And so depending on what technology you have available to you, you can pick your resources. So we have about 10 of these choice boards 
where you can choose your activity based on what you have, even if that's just pencil and paper. We also produce this 40 page summer road trip activity guide, which we have distributed through our Smithsonian affiliates and several boys and girls club chapters. This is a, a great adventure of the mind. So it's 40 pages filled with stories, puzzles and activities where you can really, really unplug and get really inspired. Um, and we know that we designed this for kids, but we know a lot of families are enjoying doing this together. So if you'd like to download a copy, I've posted the link up here. You can download it and maybe even do a page a day. Uh, this is a resource I pointed to not long ago. So if you need help talking to your kids about what's going on, um, here's a quick article to help you have that conversation. And then our S Smithsonian Science Education Center created this module, which is a curricular module also available for grade levels and available in 22 different languages produced with the World Health Organization and other wonderful global partners. This is also free and easy for you to download. And if you're looking for things to do, which are not just for you to do in school or for school and ways for you to just be creative with things you have around your home, every month we put out a small challenge. And so last month we challenged you all to look at objects that you have around your home and put together a mini exhibition. Now we all collect things, whether it's bottle caps or stamps or whatever it be, so think about pulling those objects together and share those stories with us on social media or follow these handles and these hashtags and you can see what communities nationwide are up to. This month, we know that the novelty of working in your PJs maybe have worn off a little bit and you might want to look at the Smithsonian for new inspiration for your closet. So we've had several designers actually look at the collections in the Smithsonian and put together their dream Smithsonian closet. So this is a great way for you to shop without really hurting your wallet and maybe give you a little bit of inspiration too. So all of the resources that I just talked about are at this and I will share this deck with Congressman Larson and his team. And if you ever just need help figuring out what do I, the thing that I'm looking for, where is it in the Smithsonian and you're just not able to find it, email us and we'll get back to you and tell you where it is. So I hope all of this is helpful and I'll stay around for more questions, but I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Cheryl. So next we'll go with uh, Cheryl Letterly and she's an educational resource specialist with the Library of Congress. The best, uh, the third best library in the world behind uh, the, the, the tie for the top two is Everett and uh, Snow Island Library. <laughs> <laughs> Cheryl. Thank you, Congressman Larson. And let me just echo Ruki. It is a pleasure and an honor to be invited to join you this evening. Um, so I want to introduce you to some slivers of the Library of Congress. Um, this is where it sits, right on Capitol Hill. This is the most famous of the three buildings. So I, I'm uh, sorry, I'm, on my screen, Cheryl, you're, you're not, it's not being um, advanced, it's not advancing. So try well, to, uh, I'm in good company, Rookie. You had this as well. Okay. We'll try this ag again. Uh, there we go. Try yep. You got it? Okay. Thank you. I appreciate the, the knowing. This is the most famous of the three buildings there with the green dome. This is the Thomas Jefferson Building completed in 1897 when the Library of Congress outgrew its space in the Capitol building. Um, I don't work in that building. There's a squarish marble building right behind it. That's the John Adams building. And that's where my office is when I'm in the office. Just to the left as you're facing it is the Supreme Court. And if you're standing on those steps with your back to the Library of Congress building, you'd be looking at the US Capitol um, and I love the juxtaposition of all those great institutions, and I can't resist showing that to people. So welcome to the Library of Congress. We have about 850 miles of shelf space. Just think about what is 850 miles from where you're sitting. Um, that's not all on Capitol Hill. It houses, of course, well, I'll, I'll save that. Let me, let me just save that uh, for a, another screen. Um, and we have a robust website, 
to share the portion of those items that have been digitized. Um, right now, one of the featured screens on the homepage is back to school. We have robust educational resources on a site for teachers and of course parents and caregivers and adults in children's lives are among their earliest teachers. So certainly do explore that. Uh, we recently had the National Book Festival. It was our 20th. And just so that nobody can accuse us of being in a rut, it was entirely online. Um, and that means that it remains 100% available to you from wherever you are. One of the things that was really fun about this was the opportunity to put authors in conversations with each other. And uh, so in addition to the single author talks, there are a lot of moderated conversations among authors, and I encourage you to explore those. Uh, this is an example. This is actually my director at the top, Leanne Potter, inter interviewed these two authors uh, who have each written books about parenting. And uh, so I just put that as an example of some possibilities if you're looking for some supportive advice. We also have an engage page, and this is a page targeting learners of all ages. Let me just show you a whoops. Show you around a little bit. Technology is usually not this much of a challenge for me. So it includes the National Book Festival. It includes our National Ambassador for Young People's Literature, Jason Reynolds. It includes links to poetry resources, music resources, education resources, and conversations, as it says. Um, the library hosts a lot of conversations, and when this page was um, last updated, they were featuring some conversations on democracy. Um, we have a blog, especially to highlight resources for kids and families. And this one is highlighting some brand new virtual student workshops, specially targeting students in grades three through eight. So if you're interested in that and can get a group of a minimum of 10 students, either in a, from a classroom or through a learning pod or a neighborhood, um, contact reach out and um, explore the library. There are several possibilities. I held back earlier listing all the different kinds of things that the library houses and collects. Um, audio recordings, books, of course, films and videos, including the very earliest Thomas Edison films, legislation, manuscripts, maps, notated music, newspapers, and all of this is searchable from the library's homepage. The bulk of what you'll find online is predates 1923 because that's when copyright kicks in and as the home of the US Copyright Office, uh, we are particularly respectful of that. Uh, the library staff is working very diligently to identify more recent materials for which copyright has not been renewed so that that can be made available also um, trying to get that balance between access and protecting the rights of the creator here's an example of one of my favorite collections um, this is part of children's book selections and um, there are some strange and quirky and honestly some of them are really disturbing but some of them are just very entertaining and again just to give you a sense of possibility the secret garden which might be familiar the pied piper of hamelin which might be familiar the cheerful cricket denslow's humpty dumpty and some that you have perhaps never heard of um, i hadn't heard of them but all of this is available online your tax money at work, Congressman Larson, you stole my line. I like to tell teachers when they come up at uh, conferences and shows and say, well, what do you have and how much does it cost? Well, you're paying us every, every April whether you use it or not. We also have recorded sound and here's the nat National Jukebox. Um, you can create your own playlist from this or browse created playlists. Um, just a word of caution, parents. This is real history. It's not been cleaned up and it reflects 
attitudes and language conventions of our past, some of which have changed. So <clears throat> just be aware that you might want to explore this with your children, and especially your younger children. And that's true of all of the library's materials. Here's a sampling of materials from the library's teacher collection from the state of Washington, 2nd Avenue and Marion Street in Seattle. Uh, this would be actually a stereograph picture. This was, you know, before movies that people would, would put these in, uh, we used to call them Viewmasters. This is Mount Tacoma or Rainier, Washington. And then <clears throat> one of my favorite things are these, um, these maps, these amazing maps that you can zoom in on and you can pretty much just wander up and down the streets of these these were actually made as advertising. Uh, one of the things that surprised me was the number of ships, if you look in the river, that have um, that are steamboats and have the steam trails, because that was progress at the time. One of the things we do with these kinds of objects, I'm just going to model some of the questions and thinking, is we invite observation. We ask questions like, well, what do you notice first? And these are things you can do in a classroom or do at home when you Find a picture that catches your attention. What surprises you? Why do you think this image was made? Does it look like it was candid? Does it look like it was a birthday party? Does it look like it was staged? What, what do you think the photographer was intending? What do you wonder about? Because these items provoke a lot of questions. And then here's the object in its item record. You can see that it has, it is a Yakima, I might be mispronouncing this, a Yakima woman, half length portrait facing front. And to the right of the screen, you see it, that it came from the Edward Curtis collection, which if you know anything about Edward Curtis, that tells you a lot about possible purpose. And if you don't know, well, you have a rich opportunity to learn and explore. Uh, we also have ex exhibitions. Um, Obviously, right now, they are close to the general public, but we have years and years of past exhibitions and even the current exhibitions available online for exploration. So uh, you're not missing out on anything because you're in the Northwest and we're in the Mid-Atlantic. You can explore these at your will. We also work to put together free to use and reuse sets of materials. Not everything that we put online is in the public domain, but we try to elevate the access insofar as it's possible to do so. And you can see a sense of just the range of these from maps to veterans to uh, free to use and reuse cats. The, uh, the internet really liked that set when we put that up, but they're all there. Here's an example of just a, a one that I thought was beautiful. Motion picture theaters, ranging from posters to the theaters themselves to advertisements, and clearly they cover quite an array. And then let me wrap up with a couple of ready-made interpretations. Most of what I've shown you so far are objects without a lot of interpretation. And that's really exciting as a learner because nobody else is telling you what to think. You're, you're free to explore and learn and research, but we do also have expert commentary, some in the exhibitions. And this is an example of our Today in History page. And I, I uh, strategically picked November 11th when Washington uh, State became the 42nd state in the union. And you're not alone. This is a lot of material and I've romped through it pretty quickly. Um, like Ruki, I will share, have shared with the Congressman staff, this slideshow and a PDF that has hot links to all of these materials. If you can't find what you need though, you can go to any page at the upper right, click on those three horizontal bars that my tech kid calls a hamburger and get this drop down list and you can send a question to ask a librarian. So I'm going to say thank you very much and stop my sharing. That's, uh, that's great. Um, you can get um, Rookie still out there somewhere. I am. There you go. There you go. Great. Um, well, thanks. I learned a lot already. And so um, you'll, you have at least one person who's really happy you did these presentations. 
I'm sure there'll be plenty more as well. And uh, uh, Cheryl, I'm going to come to you last with some questions. I like I like to focus on Washington State because there's a lot of exciting things um, uh, in our history here in our state. But I want to start with uh, Lois on, on a few questions. Um, can you can you talk about homework help? How and how do you coordinate the homework help uh, with the local school districts, uh, or is it is it just being a reference librarian plus? A little bit of both. That's a great question. Um, we do have staff that really uh, locally and then for the district who interact with the schools so that we really understand what the schools are doing and what support they need so that when a student comes, we're ready for those questions. So the homework help, the online homework help is um, a trained tutor who is ready to help and, and can answer pretty much any question but we do track the uh, homework that's being required from schools and, and being ready to support that. So pretty much, it's pretty hard. I, I looked to Ruki and Cheryl, but it's pretty hard to stump a librarian. We're not, we're, we're pretty good at figuring out what you need and helping you find it. Is it like that uh, syndicated television show, The Librarian, where you're oh, like, sure. like, <laughs> like, almost like in the Indiana Jones of librarians? You know, we can't let all the secrets out, but yeah, kind of. <laughs> um, and then uh, I'm, I have uh, uh, the Libby app on my, um, on my tablet, and so I can check out books electronically. Does Snow Isle use Libby, uh, the Libby app for uh, online uh, book checkout? Yeah, and I admit I'm a, a late uh, adopter of Libby, but have become. Um, so if you haven't tried it, I encourage you. It's so simple and easy to manage the returns, returning things early so someone else can have access to it, playing your audio book. It just, I remember the early days of eBooks and e-audio books and it was cumbersome. And so for some people they haven't come back, but I think just really stressing, I talked about this a little bit before, but we have unlimited access. So if a teacher wants to have a class read a book, um, we have enough copies, we can work with the teachers specifically, but that was one of the connections we made was we went to the teachers, asked them what books they wanted to uh, assign to their students and then made sure we had enough access. And one, one final question before I move to Ruki, uh, if I want the library card now, since you're not uh, open, how do I get a Snow Isle library card? You just go right on, can I do a quick screen share? I Well, I hope I can, I'm just gonna do it. I don't know if anyone can stop me from far away. <laughs> so uh, let me bring up, um, hang on, I'm uh, trying to get this open here. There we go. Um, so this is our brand new website and you can see um, right here, get a card. And up here is the help. So I'm just gonna show the help really quick under contact us. And you'll see all the ways, chat, email, phone, online, text, quick links. And then under the get a card, um, you just fill out this really quick begin your registration, fill out a couple of things. We have it a couple different languages and you'll have instant access. So um, it's super easy and we wanna make it as simple as possible for you to access these resources. That's great, great, thanks. So uh, Ruki, you, you talked about uh, the access you can uh, get uh, online to the Smithsonian. So um, can you focus on the on the .edu part and the, on the educational online resources? But I presume I can visit any museum, almost any museum within the Smithsonian online. Is, is that the, is, is, are the online port, online portals open? Is the Smithsonian open for visits from an online perspective? So we have a lot of really wonderful virtual tours available for audiences. And as you saw, I showed a little calendar of events. So there's a lot of online events happening as well. But the Smithsonian has slowly begun to reopen museums. We've started to do that since late July. We actually currently have eight locations open, the zoo, the Udvar Hazy Center, the National Museum of American History, the National Museum of the American Indian, African American History and Culture, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Renwick Gallery and the Portrait Gallery. So eight um, are slowly starting to open. We're really taking a slow and deliberate approach to reopening our museums when um, we'll start to open more gradually. 
uh, we are focusing, of course, on the health and safety of our visitors. But in the meantime, if you want to find resources to complement your learning, then there's the learning lab, and then you can also visit the online sites of all of our museums. Um, and then, um, do you have any, uh, are there new initiatives planned for online learning? We've been, you know, we've been at this since March and, you know, the Smithsonian is a learning institution. What have you learned and how is that going to change what you do, say, in the next three months? So we're continuing to take a really learner-centered approach, really asking learners, what do they need right now? And that's really how we developed the 40-page activity book, because we learned about um, disruptions to um, educational processes because of limited access or barriers to access to technology. So we're continuing to produce some no-tech uh, pieces as we go along. We hope to produce a second activity book in the winter, but we've also really amped up a lot of our virtual programs. As you know, we have a really robust system of affiliates. Um, there are six affiliate museums in Washington state alone, and we are partnering with several of those affiliates to offer virtual programs. So I know that two coming up are um, the legacy of the green book and collecting American elections. Um, the Museum of History and Industry in Seattle has been a partner on several recent programs. So even if you cannot reach the Smithsonian in DC or you know, the, you're not finding that local connection to what you're looking at online, then through our affiliates, you can make that deeper, uh, more personal connection. Okay, I don't want to put you on the spot. But can you name the six affiliates in Washington State? I'm going to try. So there's, I know one in Bellingham, Washington, okay. um, Whatcom Museum. Washington, uh, yeah, the Whatcom Museum. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there's the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture in Seattle, Washington, the Museum of History and Industry, Museum of Flight, um, the Wing Look Museum of Asian Pacific American Experience, and in Spokane, Washington, the Northwest Museum of Arts and Culture. I think that's six. Yeah, I think I got I all got, six. I got six. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's Spokane, but uh, but I got I that. To, I, didn't, I didn't ask you how to pronounce the city names. Most people don't get it right. Don't get a lot of these right anymore. But, uh, um, but that that's great. I appreciate it. I appreciate that. And then uh, Cheryl got some questions, and we have a little time. I don't know if after I ask Cheryl some questions, if anyone has questions for each other, um, you know, think about that. Um, so one of the things that um, you know, one of the things I like to do, and people ask me as a member of Congress, what's the, what's the best thing about being a member of Congress? And obviously, it's the, uh, you know, it sounds corny, but it's the public service. I mean, being a member of Congress is about, it's not about me, it's about what you get to do for folks. Um, but uh, I do say the next best thing is unlimited borrowing privileges at the Library of Congress, uh, which, which I can lose if I lose a book. And so, um, <laughs> I'm always very careful, but the idea that I can check out practically any book in the world, what I tell people, um, is, a, is a pretty good deal. And, um, uh, and I do, I read a lot and the library is a great resource for that. So I, I miss getting those books because things have kind of slowed down with the pandemic. But uh, is there any way for students or teachers or parents to access the Library of Congress Library of Congress collections um, at all? Is it through Libby and do you need a card to do that? How would you, how would uh, someone else get uh, access to the library's uh, collection? Everything that I've shown and more is available for free online as we discussed. Um, more current books, you would have to come to the library and read them on site. We're not a lending library. Um, this is why I'm so glad that Lois is on this call, right? Because there are different kinds of institutions and um, we don't tend to have a lot of popular fiction, for example. Um, it's just, you know, not what we collect primarily. Um, <clears throat> but what we do have, we have rich and amazing collections of and we provide space for scholars and by a scholar, anybody over the age of 16 can apply to be a reader at the library because 
Um, that's what we call our library cards, readers cards. Um, and you can come and you can, you can fill out the forms and have the books delivered. If the books are stored on Capitol Hill, you can have the book in a couple of hours. Um, we have outgrown our storage space on Capitol Hill. So if it's stored off site, you, you need to wait about a day. So the excellent reference librarians, um, and I'm not, well, I have a library degree. What I mostly do for the Library of Congress draws on my teaching background, though. So uh, I, I second your kudos to reference librarians. Um, I'm just in awe of my colleagues. Um, and what they suggest to researchers and readers is talk to them beforehand so that they can help you identify what you want and help you uh, secure it so that when you come, you can dive right in and start at your study carol and read with it. So anybody over the age of 16 can come and, and read, read in any of the 20 some reading rooms. And how many, um, how many buildings do you store books in, uh, in, in your other parts of the collection? Do you have any buildings around? That's a great question. I'm not 100% sure. We have the motion picture division is all in, it's in, it's down in Culpeper, Virginia. Um, close to 100 miles south of here, uh, because fun fact, the early film stock is incredibly flammable up to and including underwater. So we could not keep that on Capitol Hill. Um, for years, it was stored in Ohio at Wright-Patterson until they got this other facility. So that's one. And then we have, since I don't really work with physical collections much, I'm rusty on this. I think we have a couple of compact storage um, buildings offsite up in Maryland. Um, and those are really fun because the books are stored by size. Just imagine that, Lois. Just imagine that. They're stored by star size. They're like triple barcoded, redundantly recorded. Uh, but, but it really is for maximum space efficiency. Well, it's a pre-Dewey Decimal System, it sounds like. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's actually very modern. This is very, very modern, and and I think my librarian colleagues cringe at the thought of how these books are packed in. <laughs> but I can say that I request those offsite books as part of my work, and uh, I'm amazed at how efficiently they arrive. Yeah. So before I move, uh, maybe to another set of questions, or if either of you have any questions for each other. Um, Cheryl, I, I'm sure you get this a lot, and I'm sure it's very boring. It's like, oh yeah, here comes that question again. But a lot of people don't realize this. Uh, but the movie National Treasures has a scene, so there's a, there's a chase in the Library of Congress. And did that was that filmed in the Library of Congress, or would they just make a copy of it and film it somewhere else? Um, that was filmed in the library. Well, parts of it were filmed in the library. I have actually walked down the, through the little narrow door and down the spiral staircase, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I always end up in a book processing place and Nicholas Cage ended up in, I think, a garage. So yeah, parts of it were um, filmed on site and actually, similarly- A card catalog collection. <laughs> yeah, right, the book processing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, yeah. so and yes, book, but and not really. the book really. of secrets is really kept where? You're not gonna get me that easily. <laughs> Okay. We well, did I, we did have that prop on display for about six months. It was it was good fun to have that, and people yeah. got a real kick out of it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I don't want to remove the first one's balloon. There's there's no book of secrets. Um, but between you and me, right, there was no book of secrets. Um, so <laughs> so for Lois or Rookie or Cheryl, do you have any questions for each other, or is there something that? you wanted to pass on, wanted to be sure it's covered, that we weren't able to cover. Um, I'm gonna pop in and say I'm super excited about being a reader in the Library of Congress sometime in my life. Maybe I'll retire to DC, but, um, or maybe now that I know people who can get me in, maybe someone will sneak me in that back secret door. Um, but also just a reminder to everyone who's not a member of the Library of Congress and your local library might not have the book, we do Interlibrary Alone, one of the, most uh, favorite parts of being a librarian is how cooperative and we share things and so we share collections so we can 
almost always get the book you want. Um, and then I have a question um, for Ruki and Cheryl. In the past, you have loaned out exhibits to libraries, and I'm guessing that completely shut down um, and wondering if you see that in the future, if not immediately in the next you know, year or so, where you would loan out your um, really amazing exhibits to local libraries. Yeah, Cheryl, you want to start? Sure, since I'm unmuted. Um, I don't work in that part of the library at all. But I'm pretty confident that there is no plan to shut down services when it is safe to resume them. Um, so, you know, that's a totally unofficial guess, but I would expect that the library will resume that when it's safe and logical to do so. Ruki? We do have our Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Service, and they have been working hard with various host sites to reschedule and to, to make sure that some really great content continues to travel whenever it is that host sites are ready to reopen or even if they reopen in limited capacity that we kind of adjust uh, what that exhibition is to, to help audiences continue to connect. But great question. Thanks, Lois. Um, I think, you know, you've, you've You've given a lot of folks a, a lot of information here. And I think that probably the headline is if you need educational resources, it is available. If you can't find it at your, with, between your local library system, the Library of Congress, or the Smithsonian, it doesn't exist. Um, and, uh, and as well, what's important too, it exists in a variety of languages. So it's not just uh, in English or just in Spanish. I think, Ruki, did you mention some of the resources that are available in 22 uh, yes. languages? The, the COVID module is available in 22 different languages. So that's something that you can plug into whatever grade level and use it. So, you know, that, and like you were saying, I think if you can't find it between the three of us, then we've, I think we've all told you ways in which you can reach out because oftentimes we find that people say they cannot find it, but it comes down to that search term you're using. And that's why we make ourselves available. You can ask an expert at the Smithsonian or ask a librarian and we will help make that connection for you. That's one of the joys of our job is we serve as these connectors and facilitators where um, we have a common story. A lot of people maybe as you're studying science or looking for spiders, but maybe we have it categorized as arachnids. And so we help you make that connection when you ask a question. So don't be afraid to ask because it's people like Cheryl, Lois and me who you're reaching out to. Okay, we're gonna, all, we're gonna wrap up, but I have a, a, a question and this is gonna be a little unusual. I'm gonna start with Lois um, and it'll give the, uh, our two guests from the East Coast a chance to think about it. But you're not, as you notice, Cheryl's not one, but you're not all reference librarians, but you've certainly been asked unusual questions in your lifetime and your job. Lois, what is the most unusual request and as a librarian that you have received from someone that I'm looking for X? Uh, well, one isn't really appropriate for public uh, consumption. The one that what comes to mind- What's the second, the second most? <laughs> was a mom who came in at about 8.30 at night and asked if I had any resources to get her child to sleep because she had, was driving around the city with her child in the, in the uh, car seat and could not get them to fall asleep and did I have any resources that would help her that night to get that child to sleep. And I so have to think I out. maybe failed on that one, but that was probably um, the most unusual. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't let her check out um, Letters C through A to the encyclopedia to read through. Hey, just read the encyclopedia. I should have. Where were you when I needed you? I, I don't know. What year was it? Don't bother. Um, rookie. <laughs> How about you, Rookie? I don't know about ever being stumped or having something unusual, but I have had a group of 10 year olds laugh their heads off when I told them that you couldn't text with a rotary phone. <laughs> They thought they were living in some science fiction world. I suppose. They thought I just made it up, you know, and so sometimes it's good to see how technology has evolved and we can tell that full story at museums. Yeah, yeah. What's a rotary phone, by the way? <laughs> um, Cheryl, how about you? Well, 
One of the most difficult ones that we totally just couldn't provide was we, we did have somebody write in and say, I can't read the text of George Washington's inaugural address, but I'm really good with audio. Could you just provide me a recording? There I did was... get a I got a request for a photograph of Jesus one time. Not they didn't want a drawing, they wanted it needed to be a photograph. So maybe we could hook those people up, Cheryl. I think that's a great idea. And and I say that as respectfully as I can, you know, somebody just, I think it was probably a young patron who didn't think that through. And as Ricky says, you don't, you take for granted the technology that you know, right? Yeah, that it's always yeah. been there. Yeah. Um, but we do get a laugh out of that. Um, but so I would say you, this if I can just quickly take a moment of personal privilege. Lois, I am so glad you are here because public librarians are the conduit to all of these other great resources, right? You guys are great. And Ruki, I just want to say shortly, Ruki and I have presented together before, and shortly after a previous um, encounter, my son, who works in a public library in Richmond, Virginia, sent me a note and said, Mom, what free educational resources other than your own can you point me to? And I said, well, let me just tell you this. And I sent him to the Smithsonian. And he was really pretty happy to be able to share those with his patrons. So thank Thanks, you for, for being thank here you. and thank you for the work you do. That's great, that's great. Well, um, thank you so much, um, Lois and Ruki and Cheryl for um, participating and helping us here in the second congressional district of Washington State, uh, bring these resources directly to educators and parents and, and uh, eventually the kids uh, in the area, um, it, the pandemic's tough, and, and I you know the public health response will lead us to the economic uh, response that we need to get to to get past this. Uh, meantime, we have resources available for people through um, our Snow Isle system, our Everett Public Library, um, the Library of Congress, uh, and, the, and the Smithsonian Institution, as well as many other great places. And they are available to you and they are free and you can use them and craft them the way you want them as Ruby explained with the resources of the Smithsonian. Um, and I just I want to say thank you all for, um, for a very pleasant hour. This has been great for me too. I just, I kind of geek out on library things. And so I really, really appreciate that. Appreciate this chance to be with you all today. Thanks for helping us out here in the second district. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you for having me. All right, well, that's a wrap on Facebook Live. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you later.